This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. You should try these shades on and see what you look like. So they are now your shades. <laughs> and that's not the question. So back in the United Kingdom, you can sort of start doing medicine at age 18, and it's a five-year program. And I was at uh, the Queen's Medical Center in the UK. And I remember just being fascinated by states of consciousness and particularly anesthesia. I was thinking, isn't that incredible? Within seconds, I can take a perfectly conscious human being and I can remove all existence of the mentality and their awareness within seconds. And that stunned me. So I started to get really interested in conscious states. I even started to read a lot about hypnosis. <laughs> um, and all of these things, hypnosis, even sleep and dreams at the time, they were very esoteric. It was sort of charlatan science at that stage. And I think almost all of my colleagues and I are accidental sleep researchers, <laughs> you know, no one, as I recall in the classroom, when you're sort of five years old and the teacher says, what would you like to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. You know, no one's putting their hand up and saying, I would love to be a sleep researcher. Um, and so when I was doing my PhD, I was trying to identify different forms of dementia very early on in the course. And I was using electrical brainwave recordings to do that. And I was failing miserably. It was a disaster, just no result after no result. And I used to go home to the doctor's residence with this sort of little igloo of journals that at the weekend I would sort of sit in and uh, and read, And which I'm now thinking, do I really want to admit this? Because it sounds like I had no <laughs> social life, which I didn't, I'm yeah. a social leper. But, and I started to realize that some parts of the brain were um, sleep related areas. and some dementias were eating away those sleep related areas. Other dementias would leave them untouched. And I thought, well, I'm doing this all wrong. I'm measuring my patients while they're awake. Mm -hmm. Instead, I should be measuring them while they're asleep. Started doing that, got some amazing results. And then I wanted to ask the question, is that sleep um, disruption that my patients are experiencing as they go into dementia, maybe it's not a symptom of the dementia. I wonder if it's a cause of the dementia. And at that point, which was <clears throat> cough, cough, 20 years ago, um, no one could answer a very simple fundamental question. Why do we sleep? And I, at the time, didn't realize that some of the most brilliant minds in scientific history had tried to answer that question and failed. And at that point, I just thought, well, I'm going to go and do a couple of years of sleep research, and I'll figure out why we sleep. And then I'll come back to my patients in this question of dementia. And as I said, that was 20 years ago. And what I realized is that hard questions care very little about who asks them. They will meter out their lessons of difficulty all the same. And I was schooled <laughs> in the difficulty of the question, why do we sleep? But in truth, 20 years later, we've had to upend the question. Rather than saying, why do we sleep? And by the way, the, the answer then was that we sleep to cure sleepiness, <laughs> which is like saying, right. you know, we eat to cure hunger. Yeah. That tells you nothing about the physiological benefits of, of food. Same with sleep. Now we've actually have to ask the question, is there any physiological system in the body or any major operation of the mind that isn't wonderfully enhanced when we get sleep or demonstrably impaired when we don't get enough? And so far, for the most part, the answer seems to be no. So I think one of the ways that I think about this or one of the answers that came to me is the following. The reason that we implode so quickly and so thoroughly with insufficient sleep is because human beings seem to be one of the few species that will deliberately deprive themselves of sleep for no apparent good reason, biological. And what that led me then to was the following, mother nature as a consequence. So no other species does what we do in that context. There are a few species that do 
undergo sleep deprivation, but for very obvious, clear biological reasons. One is when they're in a condition of severe starvation. The second is when they're caring for their newborn. So for example, killer whales will often deprive themselves. The female will go away from the pod, give birth, and then bring the calf back. And during that time, the mother will undergo sleep deprivation. And then the, the third one is during migration, when birds are flying transoceanographic two, 3,000 miles. But for the most part, it's never seen in the animal kingdom. Which brings me back to the point, therefore, Mother Nature, in the course of evolution, has never had to face the challenge of this thing called sleep deprivation. And therefore, she has never created a safety net in place to circumnavigate this common influence. Hmm. And there is a good example where we have, which is called the adipose cell, the fat cell. Because during our evolutionary past, we had famine and we had feast. And Mother Nature came up with a very clever recipe, which is how can I store caloric credit so that I can spend it when I go into debt? And the fat cell was born. Brilliant idea. Where is the fat cell for sleep? <laughs> Where is that sort of banking chip for sleep? And unfortunately, we don't seem to have one because she's never had to face that challenge. But we need to sleep to be healthy is nevertheless true. Yeah, and we have many answers right now. In some ways, the question of why we sleep was the wrong question too. It's, you know, what are the pluripotent many reasons we sleep? We don't just sleep for one reason because from an evolutionary perspective, it is the most idiotic thing that you could imagine. Yeah. You know, when you're sleeping, you're not finding a mate, you're not reproducing, you're not caring for your young, you're not foraging for food. And worse still, you're vulnerable to predation. So on any one of those grounds, but especially as a collective, sleep should have been strongly selected against in the course of evolution. But in every species that we've studied carefully to date, sleep is present. Yeah, why? Because, and you know, there was an energy conservation hypothesis yeah. for a while, right. which is that we need to essentially go into low battery mode, you know, power down, because it's unsustainable. But in fact, that actually has been blasted out the water because sleep is an incredibly active process. In fact, the difference between you just lying on the couch but remaining conscious versus you lying on the couch and falling asleep, it's only a savings of about 140, 150 calories. In other words, you know, you just go out and club another baby seal or whatever it was, yeah. and you wouldn't worry, you know. So it has to be much more to it than energy conservation, much more to it than sharing you know, ecosystem space and time, much more to it than simply predator-prey relationships. If sleep really did, and, you know, looking back, even very old evolutionary organisms like earthworms, millions of years old, they have periods where they're active and periods where they're passively asleep. It's called lethargicus. <laughs> and so what that in some ways suggested to me was sleep evolved with life itself on it, this planet, and then it has fought its way through heroically every step along the evolutionary pathway, which then leads to the sort of famous um, sleep statement from a researcher that if sleep doesn't serve an absolutely vital function or functions, then it's the biggest mistake the evolutionary process has ever, ever made. And we've now realized Mother Nature didn't make a spectacular blunder with sleep. <laughs> Space. I think about it as a state space diagram. And I think it's probably more of a continuum than we have believed it to be or suggested it to be. So we used to think absent of anesthesia that there were really three main, main states of consciousness. There was being awake, being in non-rapid eye movement sleep or non-dream sleep, and then being in rapid eye movement sleep or dream sleep. And those were the three states within which your brain could percolate and be conscious. I, you know, conscious during non-REM sleep is maybe a stretch to say, but I still believe there is plenty of consciousness there. I don't believe that though anymore. And the reason is because we can have daydreams and we are in a very different wakeful state 
in those daydreams than we are when we are, as we are now together, present and extraceptively focused mm -hmm. rather than interceptively focused. And then we also know that as you are sort of progressing into those different stages of sleep during non-REM sleep, you can also still dream. Depends on your definition of dreaming, but we seem to have some degree of dreaming in almost all mm -hmm. stages of sleep. We've also then found that when you are sleep deprived, there are even individual brain cells will fall asleep despite the animal being, you know, behaviorally from best we can tell awake, individual brain cells and clusters of brain cells will go into a sleep like state. And humans do this too. When we are sleep deprived, we have what are called micro sleeps where the eyelid will partially close and the brain essentially falls, lapses into a state of sleep, but behaviorally you seem to be awake. And the danger here is road traffic accidents. So these are the, what we call these sort of micro sleep um, events at the wheel. Now, if you're traveling at 65 miles an hour in a two ton vehicle, you know, it takes probably around one second to drift from one lane to the next, and it takes two seconds to go completely off the road. So if you have one of these micro sleeps at the wheel, you know, it could be the last micro sleep that you ever have. Um, but I don't now see it as a set of, you know, very binary, distinct, you know, step function state. It's not a one or a zero. I see it more of a, as a continuum. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I do. And I think there are a number of other features too. I think, um, you know, aperture of eye. So in other words, partial closures, full closures, um, duration of those closures, duration of those partial closures of the eyelid. Um, I think there may be some information in the pupil as well, because as we're transitioning between those states, change, there are changes in what's called the automatic nervous system or Technically, it's called the autonomic nervous system, part of which will control your pupillary size. Mm -hmm. So I actually think that there is probably a wealth of information. When you combine that probably with aspects of steering, angle steering maneuver, mm -hmm. and if you can sense the pressure on the pedals as well, mm -hmm. my guess is that there is some combinatorial feature that creates a phenotype of you are starting to fall asleep. And as the autonomous controls develop, the, it's time for them to kick in. Some manufacturers, auto manufacturers, sort of have something beta version, or maybe an alpha version of, of this already starting to come online where they have a little camera in the wheel that I think tries to look at some features. <laughs> But I don't think we need to take necessarily quite that approach. I think what we could do in some clever fashion is using the individual. So what you and I are perhaps suggesting here is that there is a, an array of features that we know provide information that is sensitive to whether or not you're falling asleep at the wheel. Some of those, let's say that there are 10 of them, you know, for me, seven of them are the cardinal features. Mm -hmm. For you, however, you know, six of them, and they're not all the same sort of overlapping, are those for you. I think what we need is algorithms that can firstly understand when you are well slept. So let's say that people have sleep trackers at night, and then your car integrates that information. That would be amazing. Understands when you are well slept. Yeah. And then you've got the data of the individual behavior unique to that individual snowflake like <laughs> mm -hmm. when they are well slept this is the signature of well rested driving then you can look at deviations from that and pattern match it with the sleep history of that individual and then i don't need to find the sort of you know the one size fits all approach for 99% of the people i can create a very bespoke tailor like set of features, a Savile Row suit of sleepiness features. You know, that would be my, if you want to ask me about moonshots and crazy ideas, that's where I would go. But to start with, I think your approach is, is a great one. Let's find something that covers 99% of the people. Because the worrying thing about microsleeps, of course, unlike, you know, 
drugs or alcohol, which, you know, certainly is a terrible thing to be behind the wheel. With those, often you, you react too late. And that's the reason you get into an accident. When you fall asleep behind the wheel, you don't react at all. The, you know, at that point, there is a two-ton missile driving down the street and no one's in control. Yeah. That's why those accidents can often be more dangerous. Metric. I agree. Yeah. yeah. I think there are far more sophisticated ways that we can solve that problem uh, if we invest. Trick. I think it's a deeply embedded feature that I can imagine has a whole panoply of biological benefits. But to your point about sleep, what is interesting if you do a lot of dream research, and we've done some, it's very, very rare at all, in fact, for you to end up becoming someone other than who you are in your dreams. Now, you can have third-person perspective dreams where you can see yourself in the dream as if you're sort of, you know, you've risen above your, your physical being. But for the most part, it's very rare that we lose our sense of conscious self. And maybe I'm sort of doing a sleight of hand because it's really what I'm saying is it's very rare that we lose our sense of who we are mm -hmm. in dreams. We never do. Now, that's not to suggest that dreams aren't utterly bizarre. Yeah. And it, I mean, you know, when you slept last night, which I know um, may have been <laughs> perhaps a little less than, than me, but when you went into dreaming, you know, you became flagrantly psychotic. Mm -hmm. And there are five essentially good reasons. Firstly, you started to see things which were not there. So you were hallucinating. Second, you believe things that couldn't possibly be true. So you were delusional. Third, you became confused about time and place and person. So you're suffering from what we would call disorientation. Fourth, you have wildly fluctuating emotions, something that um, psychiatrists will call being affectively labile. <laughs> and then how wonderful, you woke up this morning and you forgot most, if not all of that dream experience. So you're suffering from amnesia. If you had to experience <laughs> any one of those five things while you're awake, yeah. you would probably be seeking psychological yeah. help. But what, so I place that as a backdrop against your astute question, mm -hmm. because despite all of that psychosis, there is still a present self mm -hmm. nested at the heart of it. Meaning that I think it's very difficult for us to abandon our conscious sense of self. And if it's that hard, you know, it's the old adage in some ways that you can't outrun your shadow. But here it's more of a philosophical question, which is about the conscious mind and what the state of consciousness actually means in a human being. So I think that that to me, you can, you become so dislocated from so many other rational ways of waking consciousness. But one thing that won't go away, that won't get perturbed or sort of, you know, manacled, is this your sense of conscious self? I mean, it's like trying to launch a rocket. You know, the energy that has to be put in to create escape velocity from the gravitational pull of this thing called planet Earth is immense. Yeah. Well, the same thing is true for, uh, for us to abandon our sense of conscious self. Yeah. The amount of biological, the amount of substances, the amount of wacky stuff that you have to do to truly get escape velocity from your conscious self what does that tell us about then the fundamental state of our conscious self? I love the fact that there are still questions that are so embryonic because, you know, I suspect it's the same with you. Answers to me are simply ways to get to more questions. You know, it's questions where, you know, questions turn me on, answers less so. And I love the fact that we are still embryonic in our sense of arguing about even what the definition of consciousness yes. is. But I also find it fascinating. I, I think it's thoroughly delightful to absorb yourself in the thought. Uh, think about the brain and we can 
move back across the complexity of phylogeny from, you know, humans to mammals, to sort of birds, to reptiles, amphibians, fish, and you can, bacteria, whatever you want. And you can go through this and say, okay, where is the hard line of, you know, what we would define as consciousness? And and I'm sure it's got something to do with the complexity of the neural system. Of that, I'm fairly certain. But to me, it's always been fascinating so what is it then? You know, is it that I just keep adding neurons to a Petri dish and I just keep adding them and adding them and adding them? And at some point when I hit a critical mass of interconnected neurons, that is the mass of the, you know, the interconnected human brain, then bingo. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden it kicks into gear and we have consciousness. Like a phase shift, phase transition of some kind. Correct. Yeah. But there is something about the complexity of the nervous system that I think is fundamental to consciousness. And the reason I bring that up is because when we're trying to then think about creating it in an artificial way, does that inform us as to the complexity that we should be looking at in terms of development? I also think that it's a missed opportunity in the sort of digital space for us to try to recreate human consciousness. We've already got human consciousness. What if we were to think about creating some other form of, why do we have to think that the ultimate in the creation of, you know, an artificial intelligence is the replication, you know, of a human state of consciousness? Can we not think outside of our own <laughs> consciousness and believe that there is something even more incredible or more complementary, more orthogonal? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sometimes, perplexed that people are trying to mimic human consciousness rather than think about creating something that's different. I want to explore how, how to make that, um, how to create that in a way that's compelling. Yeah, I love the, the line in Scent of a Woman with Al Pacino where he's speaking about the tango and he says, it, really, it's just freedom that if you get tangled up, you just keep tangoing on. Yes. I think it depends in on what conscious state you're in yes, sure. that you would be ready and receptive to. But um, Sense of Woman, I think it has one of the best monologues at the end of the movie that has ever been written or at least performed. <laughs> yeah. to come in uh, on your side and, and scream at everyone and say, what the hell are we doing here? Being, you know, unfortunately British and sort of having that slightly um, awkward sort of Hugh Grant gene, it's it's very, <laughs> very, very at the opposite end of the spectrum yeah. of the remarkable feat of uh, Al Pacino at the, the end of that scene. But, um, and yeah, integrity is, um, it's, a, it's a challenging thing and I value it much and I think, um, it can take 20 years to build a reputation and two minutes to lose it. Yeah. And there is nothing more that I value than that integrity. And, you know, if I'm ever wrong about anything, I truly don't want to be wrong for any longer than I have to be. Um, you know, that's what being in some ways a scientist is. You're, you're just driven by truth. And the irony relative to something like mathematics is that in science, you never find truth. What all you do in science is you discount the things that are likely to be untrue, leaving only the possibility of what could be true. Yeah. But in math, you know, when you create, you know, a proof, it's a proof for, you know, from that point forward, there is truth in mathematics. And there's, I think there's a beauty in that, but I kind of like the messiness of, of science, because again, to me, it's less about the truth of the answer and it is more about the pursuit of questions. Base of that. Yeah, and I think it comes down in some ways to the issue of ego, that yeah. you bond your, you know, correctness or your rightness, your scientific theory with your sense of ego. You know, I've never found it that difficult to let go of theories in the face of counter evidence, in part because I have such low self-esteem. I very much hope that 
that is part of who I am. And I remain very quietly motivated and driven. And I, like you, love the idea of perfection. And I know I will never achieve it, but I will never stop trying to. I think firstly to your, to that question, like you, I am always more afraid of not trying than trying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that to me frightens me more. But with the podcast, I think really I have two very simple goals. I want to try and democratize the science of sleep. And in doing so, my goal would be to try and reunite humanity with the sleep that it is so desperately bereft of. And if I can do that through a number of different means, um, the podcast is a little bit different than this mm -hmm. format. It's uh, going to be short form monologues um, from, from yours truly. Uh, that will last usually less than just 10 minutes. And I see it as simply a little slice of sleep goodness that can accompany your waking day. And there will be yeah. mistakes, you know, and I, I, you know, in the first edition of my book, there were errors that, you know, we corrected in the second edition too. Mm -hmm. But there will be probabilistically, you know, if yeah. you've got you know, 10 facts per page of a book and you've got 350 pages, odds are it's probably not going to be utter perfection out the gate and it will be the same way for Andrew too. But having the the reverence of um, a humble mind and simply accepting the things that are wrong and correcting them and doing the right thing, I know that that's his mentality there is a distinction so i think the first thing to say which is going to sound strange coming from me is drink coffee <laughs> um, the health benefits associated with drinking coffee are really quite well established now um, but i think that the counterpoint to that well firstly the dose and the timing make the poison. And I'll perhaps <laughs> come back to that in yes. just a second. But for coffee, it's actually not the caffeine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of people have asked me about this rightful paradox between the fact that sleep provides all of these incredible health benefits and then coffee, which can have a deleterious impact on your sleep, has <laughs> a whole collection of health benefits, many of them. Venn diagram overlapping with those that sleep provides, how on earth can you reconcile those two? And the answer is that, well, the answer is very simple. It's called antioxidants. That it turns out that for most people in Western civilization, because of diet not being quite what it should be, the major source through which they obtain antioxidants is the coffee bean. So the, the humble coffee bean has now been asked to carry the astronomical weight of serving up the large majority of people's antioxidant needs. Mm -hmm. And you can see this if, for example, you look at the health benefits of decaffeinated coffee. It has a whole constellation of really great health benefits too. So it's not the caffeine, and that's why I liked what you said, mm -hmm. this sort of separation of church and state between coffee <laughs> and caffeine. It's not the caffeine, it's the coffee bean itself that provides those health benefits. But coming back to how it impacts sleep, it impacts sleep in probably at least three different ways. The first is that for most people, caffeine can make it obviously a little harder to fall asleep. Caffeine can make it harder to stay asleep. But let's say that you are one of those individuals, and I think you are, and you can say, look, I can have three or four espressos with dinner and I fall asleep just fine and I stay asleep soundly across the night. So there's no problem. The downside there is that even if that is true, the amount of deep sleep that you get will not be as deep. And so you will actually lose somewhere between 10 to 30% of your deep sleep if you drink caffeine in the evening. Mm -hmm. So to give you some context to to drop your deep sleep by, let's say 20%, I'd probably have to age you by 15 years, or you could do it every night with a cup of coffee. I think the fourth component that is 
perhaps less well understood about coffee is its timing. And that's why I was saying the timing and the dose make the poison. Mm -hmm. The dose, by the way, once you get past about three cups of coffee a day, the health benefits actually start to turn down in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So there is a U-shaped function. It's sort of, uh, you know, the Goldilocks syndrome, not mm -hmm. too little, not too much, just the right amount. The second component is the timing though. Caffeine has a half-life of about um, five to six hours, meaning that after five to six hours, 50% of that on average for the average adult is still in the system, which means that it has a quarter life of 10 to 12 hours. So in other words, if you have a coffee at noon, a quarter of that caffeine is still circulating in your brain at midnight. So having a cup of coffee at noon, one could argue is the equivalent of tucking yourself into bed at midnight. And before you turn the light out, you swig a quarter of a cup of coffee. But that doesn't still answer your question as to why are you so immune? So I'm someone who is actually unfortunately very sensitive to caffeine. And if I have, you know, even two cups of coffee in the morning, um, I, I don't sleep as well that night. And I find it miserable because I love the smell of coffee. I love the routine. I love the ritual. I think I would love to be invested in it. It's just terrible for my sleep. So I switched to decaf. There is a difference from one individual to the next, and it's controlled by a set of liver enzymes called cytochrome P450 enzymes. And there is a particular gene that if you have a different sort of version of this gene, it's called CYP1A2. That gene will determine the speed of the clearance of caffeine from your system. Mm -hmm. Some people will have a version of that gene that is very effective and efficient at clearing that caffeine. And so their half-life could be as short as two hours rather than five to six hours. Other people, uh, hands up Matt Walker, um, have a version of that gene that is not very effective at clearing out the uh, the caffeine. And therefore their half-life sort of sensitivity could be somewhere between, you know, eight to nine hours. Mm -hmm. So we understand that there are individual differences, but overall, I guess the, the top line here is drink coffee um, and understand that it's not the caffeine, it's the coffee that's the benefit and the dose makes the poison. Not how the body is able to get rid of the caffeine, but it does alter how sensitive the body is to the caffeine. And it's not at the level of the enzyme degrading the caffeine. It's at the level of the receptors that caffeine will act upon. Mm. Now, it turns out that those are called adenosine receptors, and maybe we can speak about what adenosine is and sleep pressure and all of that good stuff. But as you start to drink more and more coffee, um, the body tries to fight back. And it happens with many different drugs, by the way, and it's called tolerance. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways that your body becomes tolerant to a drug is that the receptors that the drug is binding to, these sort of welcome sites, these sort of, you know, picture mitts, um, as it were, that receive the drug, those start to get taken away from the surface of the cell. And it's what we call receptor internalization. So the cell starts to think, gee whiz, you know, there's, there's a lot of stimulation going on. This is too much. So I'm just going to, when normally I would, you know, coat my cell with, let's just say five of these receptors for argument's sake, things are going a little bit too ballistic right now. I'm going to take away at least two of those receptors and downscale it to just having three of those. And now you need two cups of coffee to get the same effect that one cup of coffee got you before. And that's why then when you go cold turkey on coffee, all of a sudden the system has equilibriated itself to expecting X amount of stimulation. And now all of that stimulation is gone. So it's now got too few receptors mm -hmm. and you have a caffeine withdrawal syndrome. And that's why, for example, with you know drugs of abuse, things like heroin, when people go into abstinence, you know, as they're sort of moving into their addiction, they will build up a, a progressive tolerance to that drug. So they need to take more of it to get the same high. Mm -hmm. But then if they go cold turkey, 
for some p- period of time, the system goes back to being more sensitive again. It starts to repopulate the surface of the cell with these receptors. Mm-hmm. But now when they reuse and they fall off the wagon, if they go back to the same dose that they were using before, you know, 10 weeks ago or three months ago, that dose can kill them. They can have an overdose. Mm-hmm. Even though they were using the same amount at those two different times, the difference is that it's not the dose of the drug, it's the sensitivity of the system. Mm-hmm. And that's the same thing that we see with caffeine in terms of training the muscle, as it were, is the system becomes less sensitive, can calibrate. There is a huge variability. And I think everyone themselves, you know, to a degree knows it, although I'll put a caveat on that too, because it's a slightly dangerous point. So the recommendation for the average adult and who, where is the average adult in society? There is no such thing, but for the average adult, it would be probably cutting yourself off maybe 10 hours, you know, before. So assuming a normative bedtime in society, I would say, try to stop drinking caffeine, you know, before 2 p.m. and um, just keep an eye out, you know, and if you're struggling with sleep, dial down the caffeine and see if it makes a difference. Uh, sleep is profoundly and very intimately related to your memory systems and your informational systems. Um, the first, as you just mentioned, is that sleep before learning will essentially prepare your brain um, almost like a dry sponge ready to sort of, you know, initially soak up new information. In other words, you need sleep before learning to effectively imprint information into the brain to lay down fresh memory traces. Um, And without sleep, the memory circuits of the brain, and we know we've studied these memory circuits, will, you know, they essentially become waterlogged, as it were, for the sponge analogy, and you can't absorb the information as effectively. So you need sleep before learning, but you also need sleep, unfortunately, after learning too, to then take those freshly minted memories and effectively hit the save button on them, but it's nowhere near as quick as a digital system, it takes hours because it's a physical biological change that happens at the level of brain cells. But sleep after learning will cement and solidify that new memory into the neural architecture of the brain, therefore making it less likely to be forgotten. So, you know, I often think of sleep in that way as um, it's almost sort of future proofing information <laughs> in, in, in what way? Well, it means that it gives it a higher degree of assurance f- to be remembered in the mm. future rather than go through the sort of degradation that we think of as forgetting. So the brain has in some ways by default, you know, it, there is forget. And, and actually I would love to I was going to say sleep is relevant for memory in three different ways, but I'm going to amend that and say there's four different ways, which is learning, maintaining, memorizing, abstraction, assimilation, association, then forgetting, which the last one sounds oxymoronic Mm -hmm. based on the former three, but I'll see if I can explain. So sleep after learning then sort of, you know, sets the that information like amber <laughs> um in you know in in solidification the third benefit however is that sleep we've learned more recently is much more intelligent than we ever gave it credit for sleep doesn't simply just take individual memories and strengthen them sleep will then intelligently integrate and cross link and associate that information together And it's almost like informational alchemy. (laughs) So that you wake up the next morning with a revised mind wide web Mm. of associations. And that's probably the reason that, you know, you've never been told to stay awake on a problem. (laughs) You know, and in every language that I've inquired about that phrase or very something very similar seems to exist, which means to me that this creative associative benefit of sleep transcends cultural boundaries. It is a common experience across humanity. Um, (laughs) Now, I should note that I think the French translation of that is much closer to, um, I think you sleep with a problem, 
Whereas the British, you know, you sleep on a problem. The French, you sleep with a problem. I think it says so much about the romantic difference between the, <laughs> the British and the French, but let's let's not go there. Um, <laughs> that's brilliant. So such a subtle, but such a fundamental difference. Yeah. Uh, oh, good, yeah, goodness me. Sleep with the problem. <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. That's right, why I love the it. French. <laughs> um, so, and we can sort of double click on any one of these uh, and go in, into detail, but the fourth I became really enchanted by about eight years ago in our research, which was this idea of forgetting. And I started to think that forgetting may be the price that we pay for remembering. Hmm. And in that sense, there is an enormous benefit to letting go. And you may be thinking, that sounds ridiculous. I don't want to forget. In fact, my biggest problem is I keep forgetting things. But the brain is, has a, fi well, we believe, has a finite storage capacity. We can't prove it yet, but my suspicion is that that's probably true. It doesn't have an infinite storage capacity. It has constraints. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, we can't simply go through life being you know, constantly informational aggregators unless you know we are programmed to say we've got a hard drive space of about 85 to 90 years and we're good and we can do that maybe that's true i don't think that's true i think forgetting is an incredibly good and useful thing so for example you know it's not beneficial from an evolutionary perspective for me to remember where i parked my car three years ago so it's important that i can remember today's parking spot but I don't want to have the junk kind of DNA from a memory perspective of, you know, where my I parked my car, you know, two years ago. Um, now, I actually have a, in some ways, a problem with forgetting. I'm, and again, I'm not trying to sort of be laudatory, but, you know, I, I, I tend not to forget too many things. And I don't think that that's a good thing. And um, the, there was a wonderful um, neurologist, Luria, who wrote a book called The Mind of the Mnemonicist. And it was a brilliant book, both because it was written exquisitely, but he was studying these sort of memory savants who basically could remember everything that he gave them. And he tried to find a chink in their armor. And the first half of the book is essentially about him seeing how far he can push them before they fail. And he never found that place. He could never find a place where they stopped remembering. Mm -hmm. And then in his brilliance, he turned the question on its head. He said, not what is the benefit of constantly remembering, but instead, what is the detriment to never forgetting? And when you start to realize his descriptions of those individuals, it's probably a life that you would not want. Mm -hmm. So that that's something I need to sort of work on, but that's an example. good with faces? Yes, very good at faces. But not good with names. So I'm exactly like you. And there is, you know, an understanding of that in the brain too, we understand that there is partitioning of those in terms of the territory of the brain that takes care of faces and facts and places and the, they can be separate. So I will never forget a face, but you know, and as I said, I usually forget very little, but for some reason names are a struggle. I think in some ways, because I'm probably just a slightly anxious person. So when yeah. you first meet someone, which is usually the time when a name is introduced, mm -hmm. You know, you were saying you were sort of anxious maybe about sort of sitting down with me. Um, but I, I find that a little bit, you know, activating. And so it's not as though there's anything wrong with my memory. It's just the emotional state I'm in when I'm first meeting someone. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a little bit perturbing, but I will never forget their, their face. But um... I, I don't know. I think it's, you know, just allowing yourself to be an eight and who you are is also a beautiful thing too. I am not suggesting it's not important to try and better oneself. And, but I also sometimes worry about the misery that that puts us in, but like you, <laughs> yeah. I will, I, I do struggle with name, but I know for the first time when we met in the lobby, mm -hmm. um, I know exactly 
what you look like. I know that you were wearing headphones. I know the shape and the size of those headphones. You didn't have your black jacket on. I know exactly what the weave of your shirt looked yeah. like. I know what your shoes look like. And I knew exactly the height of your, the end of your pants from the yeah. top of your shoes. Yeah. And so those things I don't forget, yeah. you know, and I can That's fascinating. remember when people, I met people, you know, two years ago and I'll say, oh yes, we met there. And um, I remember you had those fantastic, you know, boots on. I thought they were bloody great pair of boots, you know, yeah. and they're like, how do you, I didn't even remember what I was wearing that day. Yeah. Yeah. I think the assimilation, the way I've been thinking about it with sleep, and it's particularly sort of dream sleep that we think can help with this assimilation is that during wake, we have one version of associative processing. And what I mean by that is we see the most obvious connections. So I think of wakefulness as a Google search gone right. Mm -hmm. Whereas I see dream sleep as doing something very different. I think dream sleep is a little bit like group therapy for memories that everyone gets a name badge mm -hmm. and sleep gathers in all of the individual pieces of the day. And it sort of starts to get you to, forces you in fact, to speak to the people, not at the front of the room that you think you've got the most mm -hmm. obvious connection with, but to speak with the people all the way at the back of the room that at first you think I've got no obvious connection with them at all. But once you get chatting with them, you learn that you do have a very distant, non-obvious connection, but it's still a connection none the same. And it's almost as though you're doing a Google search where, you know, I input, you know, Lex Friedman, and it doesn't take me to the first page of your home site. Page 20. It takes me to page 20, <laughs> which is about some like field hockey game yeah, in Utah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Now it turns out that there actually is a link if I look at it. It's a yeah. distant, non-obvious one. And to me, I find that exciting because when you fuse things together that shouldn't normally go together, but when they do, they cause marked advances in evolutionary fitness, it sounds like the biological basis of creativity. And that's exactly what I think dream sleep and the algorithm of dream sleep is designed to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a Boolean-like system where you have, you know, the sort of assumptions of true and false. You know, maybe it's more fuzzy logic system. And I think REM sleep is a perfect environment within which we do, you know, it's, it's almost like memory pinball. You know, you get the information that you've learned during the day and then you pull the lever back and you shoot it up into the attic of your brain, you know, this cortex filled with all of your past historical knowledge. And you start to bounce it around and see where one of those things lights up and you build a new connection there and you build another one there too. You're developing schemas. And so in that way, I think you could argue, you know, we dream, therefore we are. <laughs> <laughs> so, and there's, there's many scientific, you know, demonstrations of this, you know, the Mendeleev with the periodic table of elements, you know, he was trying for months to understand, I mean, talk about a, an ecumenical problem of epic proportions here's your question today. <laughs> you have to understand how all of the known elements in the universe fit together in yeah. a logical way. Good luck, take care. It was non-trivial at the time. And he would try and try, he was so obsessed with it. He created playing cards with all of the different elements on. And then he would go on these long train journeys around Europe and he would just f sort of deal these cards in front of them and he would shuffle them shuffling and shuffling and he would just try to see if he could find what the answer was mm -hmm. and then so the story goes you know he fell asleep and he had a dream and in that dream you know all of these elements started to dance and play around and they snapped into a logical grid mm -hmm. you know atomic weights etc cetera, etc cetera. and it wasn't his waking brain that solved the problem. It was his sleeping brain that solved the impenetrable problem that his waking brain could not. And there's been, you know, even in the arts and in music, some wonderful dreams, you know, Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's epic Gothic novel came to her in a dream at Lord Byron's home. Um, and then we've got, you know, Paul McCartney. Um, yesterday, the song came to him in a dream. He was in, uh, filming um, 
gosh, what was the movie? Um, I don't recall it. I should be shot because I'm from Liverpool myself. Um, and uh, but he was on Wimpole Street in London, yes. um, and filming. And they he came up with that song, the melody, um, in his sleep, not to be outdone by the Beatles. And by the way, Let It Be um, also came from a dream that mm -hmm. McCartney had. People usually give it, you know, religious overtones. You know, Mother Mary comes to me speaking mm -hmm. words of wisdom, let it be. If you've ever asked who Mother Mary is, it's not the, you know, the biblical mm -hmm. content. It's his, his mother. It's, it's, it's Mary McCartney. Yeah. <laughs> and she came to him in a dream and gifted him the song. But the best story I've heard is um, not to be outdone by the Beatles, the Stones, um, <laughs> Keith Richards, yeah. uh, who I think once was suggested that, who was it? It was a comedian who was saying that in an interview with Rolling Stone, Keith Richards suggested or inferred that young kids should not do drugs. And they said, <laughs> well, look, yeah. young kids can't do drugs because you've done all of the all drugs. Of them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I always thought that, but um, Keith Richards described, uh, he would always go to bed with his um, guitar mm -hmm. and a tape recorder. Um, and then it probably he would have a whole set of other things in the bed with him and who knows how many other people. Yeah. But <laughs> anyway, uh, and then he said in his autobiography, and I'm paraphrasing here, but one morning I woke up and I realized that the tape had recorded all the way to the end. So I rewound the tape and I hit play and there in some kind of ghostly form were the opening chords to Satisfaction, mm. the most famous successful Rolling Stone song of yeah. all of all time. Yeah. Followed by then 43 minutes of snoring. <laughs> <laughs> That's but awesome. That riff came to him, one of the most famous riffs in all of rock and roll came to him by way of a dream inspired insight. So I think, you know, there is too many of those anecdotes. And we've now got the science, you know, I don't rely on anecdotes mm. as science. We've now done the studies in the laboratory and we can reliably demonstrate that sleep inspires creativity, inspires problem solving capacity. You know, that's just basically the difference between, as you said, a, a passive approach to it versus, yeah. you know, an, an active deterministic or hope for a deterministic approach to it. In other words, that you are actually trying to harness the power of, of sleep in a deliberate way rather than an unthoughtful way. I still think that, you know, mother nature through it, you know, the 3.6 million years of evolution has probably got it mostly figured out in terms of yeah. what information should be uploaded at night and worked through. I think her algorithm is probably pretty good at this stage. It's not to suggest though that, you know, we can't, try to tweak it and nudge it. You know, it's a very light hand on the tiller is, is what he's doing. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Well, she's gifted us the architecture and the capacity to do that. To do that. What we do with that is, you know, is what life's experience dictates. Sure. She gives us the blueprint to do many, of, you know. <laughs> to that idea of not just trying to use what mother nature gave, but seeing if you can do something more or different. In a conservative mindset, I would then pose the question at what cost? Right. Because when you do something perhaps that deviates from the typical pre-programmed, you know, mother nature's program, um, I suspect it usually comes at the cost of something else. So maybe he is, you know, able to direct and focus his sleeping cognition mm -hmm. on those particular topics that will gain him better problematic resolution the next day when he wakes up. The question is though, at what cost of the other things that didn't make it onto the menu of the finger buffet of sleep that night? Mm -hmm. And is it that you don't process the emotional difficulties or events, and therefore you are less emotionally resolved the next day, but you are more problem resolved the following day? 
And so I always try to think, and I, I truly don't want to sound puritanical either about sleep. And I think I've come off that way um, many a time, especially when I started out in the public. Um, and the tone of the book in some ways, you know, I look back and think, could I have been a little softer? And the reason was I, I was that way back in when I started writing the book, which was probably something like 2014 or 15, sleep was the neglected stepsister in the health conversation mm -hmm. of the day. And I was just so sad to see the amount of suffering and disease and sickness that was caused by insufficient sleep. And for years before I'd been you know, doing public speaking and I'd tell people about the great things that happen when you get sleep, people would say, that's fascinating. And then they would go back and keep doing the same thing about not sleeping enough. And then I realized, you can't really speak about the good things that happen. It's like the news, what bleeds leads. And if you speak about the alarmingly bad things that happen, people tend to have a behavioral change. Mm -hmm. And so the book as a consequence, I think probably came out a little bit on the strong side of, you know, trying to convince, you know, people. Well, you were trying to help a lot of people and that's a powerful way to help a lot of people. I, w I was genuinely trying to help people, but, you know, f certainly for some people who, for whom sleep is not, does not come easy, then it was probably, you know, a tricky book to read too. And I think I, I feel more sensitive to those people now and emp empathetically connected to them. Um, so I think the, again, the point was simply that I don't mean to sound too puritanical in, in all yeah. of this. And the same way with, you know, caffeine and coffee. Mm -hmm. I am just a scientist and I am not here to tell anyone how to live their life. That is not my job at all. And life is to be lived to a degree. And life is to be lived if you want to do a startup. Mm -hmm. All I want to do is empower people with the understanding of the science of sleep. And then you can make an informed choice as to how you want to live your life. And I offer no judgment on how anyone wishes to live their life. I just want to try and see if the information that I have about sleep would alternatively change how you would think about your life decisions. And if it doesn't, no problem. And if it does, I, I hope it's been of use. I love the Seuss quote. Um, and I've had that experience too. Like you, I adore what I do. You know, if if someone, you know, gave you, you know, enough money to, to live the rest of your life, you know, I've got a roof above my head, rice and beans on the table. Um, and they said, you don't have to work anymore. I would do nothing different. I, yeah. I would do exactly, you know, this sounds a little crass and I hope it doesn't sound this way, but being a scientist is not what I do. It's who I am. Mm -hmm. And when that's the case, sleep, working out, showering and eating are the things that I do in between my love affair with <laughs> sleep. Yeah. I fell for sleep like a blind roofer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it was a love affair that started 20 years ago and I remain utterly besotted today. It's the most beguiling thing in the world to me. And I could easily, and I have, you know, it, it's kept me up at night when my mind is fizzing with experimental ideas or I think I've got a new hypothesis or theory, I will struggle with sleep. I really will. It it's, it's, doesn't come easy to me because my mind is just so on fire with those ideas. So I understand the, the struggle. But, you know, I couldn't advocate from a scientific perspective the schedule because the science just doesn't, you know, I would feel as though I'm doing you a disservice to say it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, that won't come with some blast radius, some, you know, health consequences. You know, you can add Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan to that list too. Both of them were very, you know, proud chess beaters of how little sleep that they get. Thatcher said four hours, Reagan, something similar, mm -hmm. you know, and I, knowing the links that we now know between sleep and Alzheimer's disease, I've often wondered whether it was coincidental then that both of them died of the 
terrible disease of Alzheimer's. Meaning, you know, maybe it doesn't get you by way of, you know, being popped out of the gene pool in a car accident because you had a micro sleep at the wheel at age 32, or it doesn't get you at 42 with, uh, you know, a heart attack or even 52 with cancer or a stroke. Maybe it gets you in your 70s. Yeah. I think the elastic band of sleep deprivation can stretch only so far before it snaps. Mm -hmm. And it ultimately seems to snap. You know, Nikola Tesla, uh, I think he, um, Nikola Tesla, he, I think, died of a coronary thrombosis, I believe. And there was a wonderful study done out of Harvard where they took a group of people who had no signs of cardiovascular disease. And what they found is that when they tracked them for years afterwards, they they were completely healthy to begin with. Those people who were getting less than six hours of sleep ended up having a 300% increased risk of developing calcification of the coronary artery, mm -hmm. which is the major sort of corridor of life for your heart. When someone says, you know, he died of a massive coronary, it's because of a blockade of the coronary artery, mm -hmm. you know, and, and Tesla, you know, passed away from a, um, a coronary thrombosis. We also know that insufficient sleep is linked to numerous mental health issues. We know that Churchill had a wicked battle with depression. Gosh, my goodness, he used to call it Black Dog that would come and visit him. And I think many of his paintings, he was an exquisite painter, but some of them would de depict his darkness with depression as well. Um, you know, Edison is interesting. People have argued that he would short sleep and he didn't put much value in sleep. Whether or not that's true, we don't know. But he was a habitual napper. You're right, during the day. I've got some great pictures of him on his inventor's bench taking a nap. And in fact, I believe he set up nap cots around his house yeah. so he could nap. But what we also know, a study, again, coming out of Harvard just um, a couple of months ago, demonstrated very clearly that polyphasic sleep is associated with worse physical outcomes, worse cognitive outcomes, and especially worse mood outcomes. So from that sense, you know, sleeping like a baby is not perfect for adults. <laughs> so th there and I think, you know, you to come back to how you started about um, David Goggins, who I've never met, but who I admire incredibly and have a, an immense reverence for the man. Um, you said two things. Is it is it wrong to do those things to yourself? And is it unhealthy to do those things to yourself? I disagree with the former and I agree with the latter. Mm. So from a health biological medicine perspective, sleeping in the way that you know, you've described or that other people may be sleeping in terms of insufficient amount, you know, science. Now, to your point too about inter individual differences usually when I see a bar graph and a mean, I usually say, show me your variance. Yeah. I want to see your variance. In other words, show me the distribution of that effect. How many people were below the mean? How many, is it all tightly clustered around this one thing? So it's a very robust effect. Or was this huge fan of effect where for some people there was no effect at all and other people there was a whopping effect and everything in between. So I don't discount into individual variability. Um, but, and I will come back to those two points about is it wrong and is it unhealthy in just a second. When it comes to sleep, we have found huge amounts of inter-individual differences in your response to a lack of sleep. But one of the fascinating things, so let's say that I take you and we're going to measure your attention, your emotion, your mood, your blood pressure, your blood sugar glucose regulation, your autonomic nervous system, and your different gene expression. Let's say I'm just going to measure a whole, you know, kaleidoscope of different outcomes, brain and body. And I find that on our measure of cognition, on your attentional ability to focus, you are very resilient. You just don't show any impairment at all, even after being awake for 36 hours straight. Does that mean that you are resilient in all of those other domains as well? The answer is no, you're not. So you can be resilient in one, but yeah. very vulnerable in another. And we've we've not found anyone who isn't at least vulnerable in one of those domains, meaning that it's somewhat safe to say that not getting sufficient sleep will lead to some kind of impairment in, in any one given individual. It may not be the same impairment, but it's likely to be an impairment. But to come back to the question, I think it's wrong to tell anyone 
that it's wrong to do what they're doing, even if they are compromising their sleep, even if they're compromising their mental health. You know, as long as they're not hurting anyone else, then I think the answer is that's that person's choice. Yeah, but that's I, that person's I, I, I like life. Yeah, I I agree with that. I think if that's a flag you're hoisting, I will definitely salute it because it really <laughs> depends, you know, what are you trying to optimize for yes. in your life? And if you are, I think the, the only danger potentially with that mindset is that if you look at many of the studies of old age and end of life, mm -hmm. most people say, I never look back on my life and wish I worked harder. I wish instead I'd spent more time with family, friends, and engaged in that aspect. Now, I'm not saying though, coming back to it, your point, that that is the standard rubric for everyone. I don't believe it is too. And there are many things that you and I are both benefiting from today, even in the field of medicine, where people have sacrificed their own longevity for the quest of solving a particular medical problem and they died quicker because of their commitment, because they wished to try and solve that problem in their pursuit of greatness scientifically. Mm -hmm. And I now benefit. Am I grateful that they did that? Incredibly grateful. You know, it's a simpler demonstration of is this. If tonight at 4 a.m. in the morning, I have a ruptured appendix, I have an appendicitis, I am incredibly grateful that there is an emergency team that will take me to the hospital at 4 a.m. in the morning. They are awake, they're not sleeping, mm -hmm. and they save my life. And that is the, that's part of what their life's mission and quest is. And they saved another's life by, in some ways, shaving a little of their own mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. So I don't take, I have no umbrage uh, with that, mentality at all. I think you just have to be very clear about what you're optimizing for. And my worry is that most people fall into the rat race and they never actually ask the question, why am I doing this? And, and for that, I think as long as you know what it is that you could be doing to yourself and you are comfortable and A-OK -okay with that, mm -hmm. I th this, I have no problem with that at all. Again, as I said, as a scientist, I cannot, should not, and will not tell anyone what they should do with their life. All I want you to be able to do is say, okay, now I understand more about the, previously these were the you know known unknowns and these were the unknown unknowns. Mm -hmm. And now I am slightly more cognizant. I have more knowns than than I had before regarding my sleep and my health, knowing that information, do I still choose to make this decision? And if that's what I offered, then I think I've done my job. That's all I want to offer is just added information into the decision algorithm. Mm -hmm. And what you end up choosing as an output of that algorithm has nothing to do with me. It's not my business and I will never judge anyone for it. And as I said, I'm immensely grateful for people who have sacrificed much in their lives to give me what I have. And that you're comfortable with it. That is, yeah. it is your conscious choice rather than feeling as though you're trapped or that you are just, you haven't thought about it. And you know, you start that job at age 32 and then you wake up the next morning and you're 65 and you think, where did my life go? What was I doing? Mm -hmm. That to me, I would feel, I would want to hug you and I would say, I'm so, I'm just, so, and I'm not sounding, I don't want to sound belittling yeah. here at all. Yeah. I would just not wish that for you. I would wish that you could have, you know, thought about what it was that you're doing and not have that regret. <laughs> I should have said, I want you to have as much high quality life. And if high quality of life means I spend five decades on this planet, but yet in that time, I am thrilled every day. I'm turned on every day by what I do. 
And I reveled in this thing called my life's work. I think that that is a 50 year journey of, of absolute delight and fulfillment that you should take. I'm not sure aware of that. And you know, that's the price you pay for the entry of into this magical, you know, kingdom that you are experiencing, which is a lovely thing. You know, I, I feel privileged too, to, I can't believe the life that I live. It, mm -hmm. It's incredible. And just like you, I don't, I do, I do, I think about mortality a great deal. I think a, a lot about death, but I don't worry about death. I, I probably, with the exception of the potential pain that comes before it, that some people, many people can suffer, that maybe concerns me, but I actually think about mortality as a tool, as I use it as a lens through which I can then retrospect. And by placing myself at the point of future mortality, I can then use it as a retrospective yeah. lens to focus and ask the following question, is there anything I feel I would regret and therefore change in the life that I currently have now. I That's the way I meditate and use mortality as a question, is to try and course correct and focus my life. I worry not about dying, yeah, but I like to think about death as a way to prioritize my life. If that makes sense, I don't know if that makes sense. That's no, it sounds good. Today. Right. And to place yourself in the future at your point of mortality is one way to, I think, as an exercise to retrospectively look back and yeah. not lose out on informed choices that you could otherwise lose out, lose out on if you weren't thinking about mortality. Funny thing about being a sleep researcher is that it doesn't make you immune right. to the ravages of a difficult night of sleep. And I have battled my own periods of insomnia in my life too. And I think I've been fortunate in ways because I know how sleep works and I know how to combat insomnia. I know how to get it under control because insomnia in many ways is a condition where all of a sudden your sleep controls you rather than you control your sleep. Wow. That's a beautiful way to put it, yeah. And I f know when I'm starting to lose control and it's starting to take control, and I understand how to regain, but i have it doesn't happen now <laughs> overnight. It takes a long time. So you've struggled with insomnia yeah. in your life? I have, not, not all of my life. I would say I've probably had three or four really severe bouts and all of them usually triggered by, you know, emotional circumstances, by stress. Um, stress that's connected to actual events in life or stress yeah. that's unexplainable? All externally triggered. Yeah, Re it's sort of what we would call reactive stress. Um, and so that, that that's sort of point number one about the idiosyncrasies. The, the point number two is that when you are having a difficult night of sleep, as a sleep researcher, you basically have become the Woody Allen neurotic of the sleep world. <laughs> because at that moment, you know, I'm trying to fall asleep and I'm not, and I'm starting to think, okay, my dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is not shutting down. My noradrenaline is not ramping down. My sympathetic nervous system is not giving way to my parasympathetic. At that point, you are dead in the water for the yeah. next two hours and nothing is bringing you back. So uh, there is some irony in that too. I would say for myself though, I if there is something I'm not proud of, it has been at times railing against my chronotype. So your chronotype is essentially, are you a morning type, evening type, or somewhere in between? Yeah. And there were times because society is desperately biased towards the morning types. You know, this notion of the early bird catches the worm. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's true, but I'll t also tell you that the second mouse gets the cheese. <laughs> yeah. So I <laughs> think a good one line. of the issues wow, a good line. Yeah. around 
you know, <laughs> is firstly, people don't really understand chronotype because I'll have some people when I'm sort of out in the public, they'll say, look, I struggle with terrible insomnia. And I'll ask them, is it problems falling asleep or staying asleep? And they'll say falling asleep. And then I'll say, look, if you are on a desert island with nothing to wake up for, no responsibilities, what time would you normally go to bed and what time would you wake up? And they would say, I'd probably like to go to bed about midnight and wake up maybe eight in the morning. And then I'd say, so what time do you now go to bed? And they'd say, well, I've got to be up for work early, so I get into bed at 10. I'd say, well, you don't have insomnia, you have a mismatch between your biological chronotype and your current sleep schedule. Mm -hmm. And when you align those two, and I was fighting that for some time too, I'm probably mostly right in the middle. I am desperately vanilla, um, <laughs> unfortunately, in many aspects of, of life. But this included, I'm neither a strong morning type nor a strong evening type. Mm -hmm. So ideally, I'd probably like to go to bed around, you know, 11, 10, 30, 11, probably somewhere between 10, 30, 11, and wake up, you know, I naturally wake up usually most days before my alarm at um, 7.04. Um, and it's 7.04 because why not be idiosyncratic in terms of sitting? I love it. Um, <laughs> and so I, that's kind of awesome. I've never heard about that. That's, that's amazing. I'm going to start doing that now, setting alarms like a little bit off the, <laughs> like, yeah, I know. I'm never quite sure why it's we a all celebration of uniqueness. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I am quite the, the odd snowflake in that sense too. Um, so I would usually then try to force myself because I had that same mentality that if I wasn't up at, you know, 6.30 and in the gym by seven, that there was something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And I quickly abandoned that. But if I look back, if there was a shameful act that I have around my sleep, I think it would be that for some years until I really started to get more detailed into sleep. Um, and now I have no shame in telling people that, you know, I will probably usually wake up around 6.45 naturally, sometimes seven. Um, when people are looking at me thinking, you're a sloth, you're lazy. Um, and, you know, I don't finish my daily workout until, you know, I'm not working until probably nine o'clock in the morning. They're thinking, what, what are you doing? Now, I will work late into the day. You know, if I could, I would work 16 hours. Mm -hmm. It's my passion, just like yours. Um, so I don't feel shame around that but I have changed my mentality around that. Um. Yeah. Yeah, to sleep in synchrony with it and harmony. Um, because normally what we know is that if you fight biology, you'll normally lose. Yeah. And the way you know you've lost is through disease and sickness. Right now, the best method that we have is something called Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia, or CBTI for short. And um, you work with, for people who don't know what it is, you work with a therapist for maybe six weeks. And you can do it online, by the way. I would um, recommend probably jumping online. It's just the easiest. Um, and it will change your beliefs, your habits, your behaviors, and your general stress around this thing called sleep. And it is just as effective as sleeping pills in the short term. But what's great is that unlike sleeping pills, when you stop working with your therapist, those benefits last for years later. Whereas when you stop your sleeping pills, you typically have what's called rebound insomnia, where your sleep not only goes back to being as bad as it was before, it's usually even worse. Mm -hmm. For me, I think I found a number of things effective. The first is that I had to really address what was stressful and try to come up with some degree of meaningful um, rationality around it. Because I think one of the things that happens, there's something very, talking about conscious states to come all the way back to, um, gosh, I don't know. I feel like we've only been chatting for like 20 minutes, but you're gonna tell me it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> okay, I'm desperately, I'm, I feel uh, terribly sorry. I, okay, but this let's come back to conscious states, which is where we, where we started. Yeah. Um, there is something very strange about the night yeah. that thoughts and anxieties are not the same as they are in the waking day. They are worse, they are bigger. And I at least find that I am far more likely to catastrophize and ruminate 
at night about things that when I wake up the next day in the broad light of day, I think it's nowhere near that bad, Matt. What were you doing? It's not that bad at all. Yeah. So to gain firstly some rational understanding of my emotional state that's causing that insomnia was very helpful. Yeah. The second thing was to keep regularity, just going to bed at the same time, waking up. And here's an unconventional piece of sleep advice. Mm -hmm. After a bad night of sleep, do nothing. Don't wake up any later. Don't go to bed any earlier. Don't nap during the day. And don't drink any more coffee than you would otherwise. Because if you end up sleeping later into the, the morning, you're then not going to be tired at your normal time at night. So then you're going to get into bed thinking, well, I had a terrible night of sleep last night. And yes, I slept in this morning to try and compensate, but I'm still going to get to bed at my normal time. But now you get into bed and you haven't been awake for as long as you normally would. So you're not as sleepy as you normally would mm -hmm. be. And so now you sit there lying in bed and it's another bad night. Yeah. And the same thing is, you know, if you go to bed any earlier, so don't wake up any later, wake up at the same time, don't go to bed any earlier, because then you're just probably, your chronotype, your biological rhythm doesn't want you to be asleep. And you think, well, it's a ter terrible night. I'm gonna get into bed at 9 p.m. rather than my standard 10. You're just gonna be lying in bed awake for that hour. Naps will take our double-edged sword. They can have wonderful benefits. And we've done lots of studies on naps for both the brain and the body. But they are a double-edged sword in the sense that Napping um, will just take the edge off your sleepiness. It's a little bit like a valve on a pressure cooker. When you nap during the day, you can take some of that healthy sleepiness that you've been building up mm -hmm. during the day. And for some people, not all people, but for some people that can then make it harder for them to fall asleep at night and then stay asleep soundly across the night. So the advice would be if you're struggling with sleep at night, don't nap during the day. But if you are not struggling with sleep, and you can nap regularly, naps are just fine. And we can play around with optimal durations depending on what you want. Just try not to nap too late into the day because napping late into the day is like snacking before your main meal. Yeah. It just takes the edge off your sleep hunger as it were. But that would be, um, so that's my unconventional second piece of advice regarding insomnia. The third is meditation. I found meditation to be incredibly powerful. I started reading about meditation as I was researching that aspect of the book um, many years ago. And as a hard-nosed scientist, I thought this sounds very woo-woo. Um, this is sort of, we all hold hands and sing Kumbaya and everything's going to be fine with sleep. I read the data and it was compelling. I couldn't ignore it. And I started meditating and that was six years ago and I haven't stopped. Hmm. And I find meditation before bed incredibly powerful. The meditation app companies were perplexed at this at first. They want people to meditate during the day. But when they looked at their usage statistics, they found that they would have people in the morning meditating. And then there's a huge number of people using the meditation app in the evening. What they were doing was self-medicating their, their insomnia. Mm -hmm. And they finally, rather than railing against it, they started to see it as a cash cow. Um, <laughs> rightly so. Yeah. So I, I found meditation to be helpful. Having a wind down routine is the other thing that's critical for me. I can't just go from, because when my mind is switched on, and I think you may be like this too, if I get into bed, that Rolodex of thoughts and information and excitement and anxiety and worry is just whirling away and it's not gonna be a good night for me. So I have to find a wind down routine. And that makes sense when you realize what sleep is like. Sleep is not like a light switch. Um, sleep is much more like trying to land a plane. You know, it takes time to descend down onto the terra firma that we call sound sleep at night. And we have this for kids. You know, I don't have children, but you know, a lot of parents will say, you know, we have to have the bedroom, you know, sorry, the bedtime routine. You know, you bathe the kid, you put them in bed, you read them a story. You have to go through this routine, this wind down routine for them. And then they fall asleep wonderfully. Why do we abandon that as adults? We need that same wind down routine. So that's been the other thing that's been very helpful to me. So 
Um, don't do anything different. If you have a bad night of sleep, keep doing the same thing. Manage your anxiety, understand it, rationalize it. Um, then meditation, and then finally having some kind of disengagement, wind down routine. Those are the four things that have been very helpful to me. The best evidence that we have to speak to this question is people who are doing rotating shifts. And unfortunately, the news <laughs> is not good. Um, yeah. They usually have a higher instance of many diseases such as um, depression, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, um, stroke, and and again, I'm. That's just me communicating the data that we we have, and I'm not telling you that you should do anything different. The other th thing is that there's nothing in your biology that suggests that that's how your body was designed mm -hmm. to sleep. Um, it is a system that loves habit. You know, if if your circadian clock in your brain, it's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, um, sits in the middle of your brain, had a personality trait, it would be a creature of habit. <laughs> it loves habit. Yeah. That's how your biology is designed to work is through very archetypal, prototypical, expected cycles. And when we when we do something different to that, then you start to see some of the pressure, stress, fractures in the system. But again, to your point, if that's something that you don't mind, you know, adopting and understanding and um, then I think you should keep doing Actually, I just have one quick point on that too. You know, we often think about sleep as a cost, but instead I think of sleep as an investment. And the reason is because your effectiveness and your efficiency when you're well slept typically exceeds that when you're not. And to me, it's the idea of if I'm going to boil a pot of water, why would I boil it on medium when I could boil it in half the time on high? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I sometimes worry that when I speak to Fortune 500 companies and, you know, they're of this mentality of, you know, long hours, getting people to rise and grind. The first point is that after about 20 hours of being awake, a human being is as cognitively as impaired as they would be if they were legally drunk. And the reason I bring that point up is because I don't know any company or CEO who would say, I've got this great team, they're drunk all the time. <laughs> but we often laud the airport warrior who's flown through three different time zones in the past two days, is on email at 2 a.m. and then is you know in the office at six. And I think there is some aspect, not in all people, but there is sort of some aspect of that sort of slight sleep machismo. And and that's not what you are very different. You know, you are driven by a purity of passion and a very authentic, incredibly genuine goal of wanting to do something remarkable with your life. That's not the issue I think I'm, I'm speaking about. It's just simply that I think the... this notion of wanting to be awake for longer to try and get more done right. can it's, sometimes be at odds with the fact that you can actually get so much more done mm -hmm. if you're well. Right. Again, it's this notion of, you know, life is to be lived to, a, to be lived. a degree. <laughs> but, you know, if you do have children, um, I think one of the other things that then maybe comes into the picture is the fact that now there are other people that you have to live for. It's going to be that kind of fatherhood. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm understanding so way. much more it's about Lex Friedman than I than I. Than I. Although I would say uh, having. 
uh, you know, um, chatted with Joe for, for some time. Um, uh, I think he is a delightful sweetheart, independent of children. I think, um, uh, don't get me wrong. I don't want to be in a ring with him. <laughs> he would face me five ways till Tuesday, but, um, I think he's a desperately sweet man and a very, very smart individual. We have some data I would prefer more, but we have data both on time restricted eating. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have some data on fasting to a degree on time restricted eating. I think that it has some benefits, although the human replication studies have actually not borne out quite the same health benefit extent that the animal studies have. There've been some disappointing um, studies, one here close to, uh, to where we are right now at UCSF recently. So I think time restricted eating can be a good thing. And there are many benefits of time restricted eating. Is sleep one of them? No, it doesn't seem to be. Mm. Because there are probably at the time that we're recording this, three pretty decent studies that I'm aware of. Um, two out of the three were in obese individuals. One out of the three were in healthy weight individuals. And what they found was that time-restricted eating in all three of those studies didn't have any advantageous benefit to sleep. It didn't necessarily harm sleep, but it didn't seem to improve it. When it comes to fasting though, which is a different state, we don't have too many studies, experimental studies with long-term fasting. The best data that we have is probably from re religious practices. And probably the most data we have is during Ramadan where people will fast for 29 to 30 days from sunrise to sunset. Mm -hmm. um, and under those conditions, there are probably, there are probably five distinct changes that we've seen. None of them seem to be particularly good for sleep. The first is that the amount of melatonin that you release, and melatonin is a hormone. It's often called the hormone of darkness um, or the vampire hormone, not because it makes you look longingly at people's <laughs> necklines, but it's just because it comes out at night. Yeah, Melatonin signals to your brain that and your body that it's dark, it's nighttime, and it's time to sleep. Those individuals, when they were undergoing that regimen of fasting, they the amount of melatonin that was released and when it was released, the amount of melatonin decreased. And the, when it was released came later, that was the first thing. The second thing was that they ended up finding it harder to fall asleep as quickly as they normally would otherwise. The third thing was that the total amount of sleep that they were getting decreased. The fourth fascinating thing was that a wake promoting chemical called orexin increased and this is why a lot of people will say, Look, when I'm fasting, it feels like I can stay awake for longer mm. and I can, I'm more alert, I'm more active. And I'll come back to, from an evolutionary perspective, why we understand that to be mm -hmm. the case. And then the fourth factor is that fasting didn't decrease the amount of deep sleep that seemed to be unaffected. It did, however, decrease the amount of REM sleep or dream sleep. Mm -hmm. And we know that REM sleep dreaming is essential for emotional first aid, mental health. It's critical for memory, creativity. It's also critical for several hormone functions. It's when, you know, if you, there's direct correlations between testosterone, you know, testosterone release peaks just before you go into REM sleep and during REM sleep too. So REM sleep is critical. But so those are the five changes that we've seen. None of them seem to be that advantageous for sleep. But the fourth point there I mentioned, which was orexin, which is this wake promoting chemical. And a good demonstration or a very sad demonstration of its power is when it becomes very deficient in the brain and it leads to a condition called narcolepsy, mm. where you're know you know, you you're just unpredictable with your sleep and you, um, so, um, so orexin when it's in high concentrations keeps you awake. When you lose it, it can, you know, it can put you very much into a state of narcolepsy where you're sleeping a lot of the time and unpredictable sleep. Why on earth when you are fasting would the brain release a wake promoting chemical? And our answer is right now is the following. The one of the few times that I mentioned before that we see animals undergoing insufficient sleep or 
prolonged sleep deprivation is under conditions of starvation. Mm -hmm. And that is an extreme evolutionary pressure. And at that point, the brain will forego some, it won't forego all, but it will forego some of its sleep. And the reason is so that it can stay awake for longer because the sign of starvation is saying to the brain, you can't find food in your normal foraging perimeter. Mm -hmm. You need to stay awake for longer so you can travel outside of your perimeter for a far, further distance, and maybe you will find food and save the organism. So in other words, when we fast, it's giving our brain this evolutionary signal that you are under conditions of starvation. So the brain responds by saying, oh my goodness, I need to release the chemical that helps the organism stay awake for longer, which is orexin so that they can forage for more food. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, your brain from an evolutionary perspective doesn't know about this thing called Safeway that, <laughs> that you could easily go to and break the fast. Mm -hmm. But that's how we understand fasting. And I think, you know, my dear friend, Peter Atiyah has, um, has done a lot of work in this area too. I think fasting and David Sinclair's brilliant work, goodness me, what a, an individual too. The work is pretty clear there that, you know, time restricted eating and fasting have wonderful health benefits. Time, you know, fasting is, creates this thing called hermesis, mm -hmm. just like exercise and low level stress and sauna, heat, shock. Um, and hormesis is a biological process, I think, as David Sinclair has once said, in simple layman's terms is what, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> and I think the there is certainly good data that fasting and time-restricted eating has many benefits. Is sleep one of them? It doesn't seem to be. It doesn't seem to enhance sleep. And I think, yeah, I, as we said, you know, for <laughs> with biology, you don't get if there is free if there's a gain, there's yeah, there's often a cost too. So, <laughs> but we are, at least understand the biological basis of what you're describing. It's not that you you actually don't need less sleep. It's that this chemical is present that forces you more awake. And so subjectively you feel as though I don't need as much sleep because I'm wide awake. Mm. And those two things are quite different. It's not as though you, your sleep need has decreased. It's that your brain has hit the overdrive switch, the overboost switch to say, we need to keep you awake because food is in short supply. So one of the camps in the sleep field is that dreams are meaningless, mm. that they are an epiphenomenal byproduct of this thing called REM sleep from which dreams come from as a physiological state. So. The analogy would be, um, let's think of a light bulb, that the reason that you create the apparatus of a light bulb is to produce this thing called light mm -hmm. in the same way that we, we've we evolved to this thing called REM sleep to serve whatever functions REM sleep serves. But it turns out that when you create light in that way, you also produce something called heat. It was never the reason that you designed the light bulb. It's just what happens when you create light in that way. And the belief, so too, was that dreaming was essentially the heat of the light bulb. That REM sleep is critical, but when you have REM sleep with a complex brain like ours, mm -hmm. you also produce this conscious epiphenomenon called dreaming. I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> uh, I And from a simple perspective is that I suspect that dreaming is more metabolically costly as a conscious experience than not dreaming. So you could still have REM sleep, but absent the conscious experience of dreaming was probably less metabolically costly. And whenever mother nature burns the energy unit called ATP, mm -hmm. which is the most valuable thing, <laughs> uh, there's usually a reason for it. So if, we're, if it's more energetically demanding, then I suspect that there is a function to it. And we've now since discovered that dreams have a function. The first, as we mentioned, creativity. The second is that dreams provide a form of overnight therapy. Dreaming is a form of emotional first aid. 
And it's during dream sleep at night that we take these difficult, painful experiences that we've had during the day, sometimes traumatic, and dream sleep acts almost like a nocturnal soothing balm. Mm -hmm. And it sort of just takes the sharp edges off those difficult, painful experiences so that you come back the next day and you feel better about them. And so I think in that sense, dreaming, it's not time that heals all wounds. It's time during dream sleep that provides emotional convalescence. So dreaming is almost a form of, you know, emotional windscreen wipers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and I think, and by the way, it's not just that you dream, it's what you dream about that also matters. So for example, scientists have done studies with learning and memory where they have people learn a virtual maze. And what they discovered was that those people who then dreamed, but dreamed of the maze, were the only ones who, when they woke up, ended up being better at navigating the maze. Whereas those people who dreamed, but didn't dream about the maze itself, they were no better at navigating the maze. So it's not just that you, it's not, it's sort of necessary, but not sufficient. It's necessary that you dream, but it's not sufficient to produce the benefit. You have to be dreaming about certain things itself. And the same is true for mental health. Mm -hmm. What we've discovered is that people who are going through a very difficult experience, a trauma, for example, a very painful um, divorce, those people who are dreaming, but dreaming of that difficult event itself, they go on to gain resolution to their clinical depression one year later. Whereas people who were dreaming just as much, but not dreaming about the trauma itself did not go on to gain as much clinical resolution to their depression. So it's, it, it, I think to me, those are the lines of evidence that tell me dreaming is not epiphenomenal. And it's not just about the act of dreaming, it's about the content of the dreams, not just the fact of a dream itself. Act in the right, world. you create a set of decision weights yeah. based on experience and you constantly update those weights based on ongoing learning. No, I think uh, it's, and it's been a theory that's been put forward, which is that dreaming is a virtual reality test space that is largely consequence free. Yeah. What an incredible gift to give a conscious mind each and every night. It's been a longstanding issue in cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience too, is how, how does the brain create an archetype? How does it create schemas that are have general applicability, um, but yet still obtain specificity? That's a very difficult challenge. I and mean, we can do it, we do it. It's yeah, rather I, bloody amazing. And it seems like part of the toolbox is this controlled hallucination, which is dreams. <laughs> well, it's a relaxing of the rigid constraints. You know, I often think of dreaming as, you know, it's from an information processing standpoint, you know, the prison guards are away and the prisoners are running amok in a delightful way. And part of the reason is because when you go into dream sleep, the rational part of your brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is the part, it's like the CEO of the brain. Mm -hmm. It's very good at making high level, rational, top-down decisions and controlled actions. That part of the brain is shut down during REM sleep. But then emotional centers, memory centers, visual centers, motoric centers, all of those centers actually become more active. In fact, some of them are more active than when we're awake mm -hmm. in the dream state. That's fascinating. So your brain from a neural architecture perspective is radically different. Its network feature is not the same as wakefulness. And I think this is an immensely beneficial thing that we have at least two different rational and irrational conscious states that we do information processing in. The rational, the veritical, the page one of the Google search is wakefulness. <laughs> the more irrational, illogical, hyper-associative Google page 20 is the REM sleep. Both I think are critical, both are necessary. <laughs> 
And in some ways, we also know it from a chemical perspective too. When you go into dream sleep, it is a neurochemical cocktail like no other that we see in the at the rest of the 24 hour state. There is a chemical called noradrenaline or norepinephrine in the brain. And you know of its sister chemical in the body called adrenaline. Um, but upstairs in the brain, noradrenaline is very good at creating a very hyper-focused, attentive, narrow, it's sort of um, very um, convergent way of thinking to a point, sharp, focus, that's the only thing. The spotlight of consciousness is very narrow. That's noradrenaline. Mm -hmm. When you remove noradrenaline, then you go from a high SNR, a high signal to noise ratio, where it's just you and I in this moment. I don't even know what's going on elsewhere. I am with you, noradrenaline is present. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when you go into REM sleep, it is the only time during the 24 hour period where your brain is devoid of any noradrenaline. It is completely shut off. Mm -hmm. And so the signal to noise ratio is very different. It's almost as though we're injecting a greater amount of noise into the neural architecture of the brain during dream sleep, as if it's chemically brute forced into this relaxed associative memory processing state. Mm -hmm. And then from an anatomical perspective, just as I described, the prefrontal cortex goes down and other regions light up. So it is a state that seems to be very, I mean, if you were to show me a brain scan of REM sleep and and tell me that it's not REM sleep, just say, look, based on the pattern of this brain activity, what would you say is going on in this person's mind? I would say, well, they're probably not rational. They're probably not having logical thought because their prefrontal cortex is down. They're probably feeling very emotional because their amygdala is, is active, which is an emotional center of the brain. They're definitely going to be thinking visually because the back of the brain is lit up, the visual cortex. It's probably going to be filled with past experience and autobiographical memories because their, their memory centers are lighting up. And there's probably going to be movement because their motor cortex is very active. That to me sounds very much like a dream. And it, that's exactly what we see in brain scanners when we've put people inside of them. Yeah, I think it's, it's very powerful and strong. So we've done a lot of work in the field of sleep and emotion and sleep and moods. And you can separate your emotions into two main buckets, um, you know, positive and negative. And what's interesting is that when you are sleep deprived and the more hours that you go into being awake and the fewer hours that you've had to sleep, your, your negative mood starts to increase and and we we know which individual types of emotions are changing. I've got a wonderful um, postdoc in my lab called Etty Ben Simon, who's doing some incredible work on trying to understand the emotional individual emotional tapestry of affective meltdown <laughs> when you're not getting <laughs> sufficient sleep. But let's just keep with two dimensions: positive and negative. Yes. The negative, most people would think, well, it's the negative that takes the biggest hit when I'm sleep deprived. It's not. By probably an or a log order magnitude larger is a hit on your positive emotions. In other words, you stop gaining pleasure from normally pleasurable things. And it's a state that we call anhedonia. And anhedonia is the state that we often call depression. So depression to most people's surprise, isn't necessarily that you're always feeling negative emotions. It's often more about the fact that you lose the yeah. pleasure in the good things in life. That's what we call anhedonia. That's what we see in sleep and insufficient sleep. And it happens quite quickly. trouble. <laughs> so you have, yeah. you have to balance those two things. But yes, it's but, fascinating. But there's oh. irony there too, yes. which is the fact that, you know, when you're well rested and well slept, just as you said, you see the the beauty in life and it sort of enlivens you and sort of gives you a, a, a quality of, of life that's emotionally very different. Yet then we are 
contrasting that against the need for not getting enough sleep because of the beautiful things that you want to accomplish in life. And I don't actually see them as, you know, sort of completely counterintuitive or paradoxical because I still think that you can strive for all of the brilliant things that you are striving for to have the monumental goals, the Herculean challenges that you wish to take on and solve. Um, they can still enthrall you and excite you and stimulate you. But because of the insufficient sleep that they can or that goal can produce, it will shave off the beauty of life that you experience in between. And again, this is just about the trade-off. I will say though that, and this is not um, applicable to your circumstance, um, we do know that insufficient sleep is very strongly linked to suicide ideation, suicide attempts, and tragically suicide completion as well. And in fact, in 20 years of studying sleep, we have not been able to discover a single psychiatric condition in which sleep is normal. Mm. And I think that that is a profound state. I think it tells us so much about the role of sleep as a potential causal agent in psychiatric conditions. Mm -hmm. I also think it's a potential sign that we should be using sleep as a tool yeah. for the prevention of grave mental illness. Mm. Yeah, and so it's it's, def it's definitely true, and it's funny how sleep can just cure all of that. There's actually a beautiful quote by an American entrepreneur called E. Joseph Kosman, who once said that the best bridge between despair and hope is a good night's sleep. <laughs> and I spilled uh, it's quite true. so much ink and hundreds of pages inelegantly trying to say the same thing in my book. And he said it in one line and line. it's beautiful. For me personally, I think the, the meaning of life is, is to eat, is to sleep, is to fall in love, is to cry, and then to die. Oh, and probably race cars in between. You're a brilliant man and you're doing amazing things. And I feel immensely honored to have met you, to now know you and um, to start calling you a friend. Thank you for Thank what you man. do for the world and um, for me included. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Take care. This is the Lex Free Podcast.